Hello and welcome to Lore Watch, our roundtable freeform discussion about lore and our favorite media. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my stupendous co host with me today, Matt Rossi. How are you doing today, Matt? I feel like I could be played by Robert Downey Jr. Well, I mean, we're going to be talking about that at some point because I feel that's going to be topical. Um, for those of you at home, if you haven't seen the news, Robert Downey Jr. is back in the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe, but not as Tony Stark as Dr. Doom, and it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, we'll probably do an episode about that because there's some two really cool comic arcs uh, that deal with that exact concept of what if Tony Stark was Dr. Doom, essentially. Uh, and I always thought it was fascinating, so maybe we'll talk about it at some point in some of the other Elseworld stuff. I'm telling you right now, you're going to also have to talk about the, the time that that Dr. Doom and Tony Stark ended up traveling back in time to the Arthurian era, which is the canonical reason why Dr. Doom and Morgan Le Fay have had sex. Yes, that is a thing. And I yep. think they have child too, right? I don't remember if they have a child or not, but they've definitely had sex. Yeah. It, it all this is sort of ties in and, and is topical because again, if you've seen mild spoilers at this point, but Dr. Strange two deals with a lot of the stuff involving the multiverse, but more specifically the dark hold, which is sort of like the obulette uh, of the Marvel universe where all the big evil, nasty things go to live and, and, and yeah, it's their Necronomicon. It is 100% their Necronomicon. Uh, and one of the two individuals that is able to read from the dark hold and not go absolutely insane or be completely possessed is Victor Von doom. But we're not here to talk about that today. Although we absolutely could. And I wish I would have thought of it sooner because we absolutely would have. We'll probably do that next week. Uh, we're going to be answering questions from you, our wonderful listeners. If you have questions for this or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. If you want to hit us up on Discord and not email, you can hit us up on the Q and Podcast Questions channel. If you are a Patreon subscriber, you can send those into the Patreon Q and Podcast Questions channel, where we tend to look there first as a way of saying thank you to our supporters for keeping the lights on. All we ask is that you specify the show that it is for, as well as any special pronunciation of your name. Thank you very much. So without further ado, let's get into a series of questions from VizLink. Uh, or Vic's link. Apologies. There's a K in there. Uh, we'll start with the first one because why not? It's number one. We'll still, we've still never seen the Skardin in game, but as they're very local to Grim Batal, do you think we'll ever see them in the Grim Batal dungeon? We only visit a small area of the place. So there certainly is room for more expeditions into it. The whole area just feels like it was never really properly dealt with and remains a threat quite close to Ironforge. There's a lot of truth in that. Grim Batal is one of those, it, it's one of my favorite dungeons. Um, not because it's particularly good in terms of like mechanics. In fact, at the time at level, it was one of the wor one of the worst for pugs. Uh, if you went in there, you just expected to be in there for a long while, but mostly because of its its history, right? Uh, Grimmatal is, is tied up with the, the red dragons and the dragon aspect. It's tied up with the dra uh, the demon soul. Uh, it's tied up with the dragon maw clan. And then it's tied up with uh, a bunch of the old gaudy goodness, including Zalatath, which we talked about in our Zalatath episode. But what do you think, man? Who are, do you think we'll hear more from this card? And do you think it's something we should explore more? I mean, they're in the next expansion. Are they really? Why don't we talk about that? Who are the Skarden? Uh, well, the thing is, is that the Skarden in the War Within are not the same Skarden as we've we already had. The original Skarden are the Dark Irons that came into Grimbatal alongside Modgood, and they were corrupted by Zalatath's influence. And the reason that they became the Skarden was that they had to hide. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the they went into Grimbatal with Modgood, and uh, you know, unfortunately for them, Modgood died and Zalatath vanished, and the place was so corrupted by you know uh, Zalatath's presence that when uh, they fled into its depths, they became. Yeah, I was gonna say Go technically, ahead. technically, it wasn't just Zalatath's presence. Uh, we talked about this before. Modgood wielding Zalatath essentially evoked the curse 
<laughs> like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like yeah. summoning its power. So that that thing that, that power has been seeping there for a while. And so the discarding that we saw uh, from Grimbatal, the first group of them, are the remnants of those Dark Iron Doors that were corrupted and transformed into horrible pseudo blasphemous parodies of dwarves. Um, the new Skarden, we don't know their origin yet, but we know that they're corrupted earthen from Kaz Algar, and they're also corrupted by Zalatath. So Zalatath seems to think this is something that, sh- that they like to do. Maybe Zalatath thinks it's funny. Maybe Zalatath doesn't like dwarves very much. I mean, Zalatath likes dwarves a lot, and that's like keeps making them into horrible monster people. Regardless, that's who the, the Skarden that we're going to see in the War Within are. Yeah, the original concept art for the Skarden was something that I, I remember looking at, and it was, for back, lack of a better term, it reminded me a lot of sea giants. Uh, very scaly, the beard... Uh, was essentially replaced with like a network of, of scales. The the hide of the skin was very thick. The arms were elongated, almost dragon esque, uh, as well as the feet with plenty of spikes and frills everywhere. And some of the characteristics of that definitely carried over, like the mouthful of like sharp teeth, uh, the sightless eyes. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was I believe described that they uh, determine at least the ones we meet in Grimmatall. Uh, they determine their surroundings by sense of smell, almost more animal than than sentient being. Uh, and it's one of those interesting things, like, why is this happening again? Is Altath just causing random mutations? Is there a purpose for it? Why, why was the original concept close to uh, something almost dragon adjacent? Uh, I'm very curious about a lot of that stuff. Because we don't really get to see a, a whole a whole lot of it, really. Yeah, I mean, for for all that matter, I mean, we don't even know for sure. We know that the Skarden were created by the curse from Salatath, but we also know that they were working for Deathwing for a while there. Yeah, that's uh, true. And it's not it's entirely possible that Deathwing made them dragony, just because he doesn't like it when things aren't dragony. I, I you know don't know. And he, is- I, I know that. Go ahead. I was going to say, as Deathwing, his power was, you know, pretty. He drew on shadow as much as he did uh, yeah. every every other aspect of Azra. So it could be just something he did. I, yeah, it could have been. I mean, for that matter, I mean, he was also the the, the chosen Earth Warder. So the Skarden lived apparently so deep under Grim Batal that we never actually go there. Uh, the reason you don't see the Skarden in the Grim Batal dungeon is apparently that they decided to use trogs instead because this garden would be so, so deep that you would like not normally see them, even though they were originally going to be in Grimms Hall. And yeah. in fact, there's even still spells and items the that are tro- named after them. Yeah. I was gonna say, don't the trogs have an ability? Like it's like mod goods malady or something like that. Yeah. The, the malignant trolls, trogs have it. Yeah. But I mean, uh, to mod be f- goods malady and mod goods malice, I think are the two. Yes, that's right. I mean, to be fair, there was a lot of similarities between, I guess, Trogs and sort of what happened to the Dark Iron Doors. It it almost feels like the intention was to have a de-evolution, sort of like a really bad Mario movie. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe maybe that's going to be tied in there somewhere as well. Corrupted Earth and awesome. de-evolving into Trog Trogs uh, could be a thing it, that could be, this could be the in-between step. Cause I, have we seen concept art for the new Skarden yet? I have not seen any such concept art. Uh, I've been looking for it, but I have not seen it. Uh, well, I think, no, I think that they're more dwarf like from what I've seen. unless the internet is to be believed, which, Hey, who knows? Maybe, uh, but it looks like there is some data mining for it where, they're very similar to uh, dwarves like we would expect, but they have uh, purplish hues, like grayish skin, bluish eyes. Um, they're still more dwarf in appearance than than otherwise. Yeah. Um, the, one I've only, the only one I've seen is the Deviant uh, Skarden, which is a kind of like, it's like you start with a dwarf and then you give it like Venom's mouth and giganto hands with claws. And that's, so it's, not all that dwarfy, to be completely honest with you, in the one I've seen. But 
Yeah. Uh, now, to uh, go back, yeah. Well, I was going to go back to the other part of the question, though. The discussion of whether or not we'll go back to Grimbatal because it was sort of left, sort of hanging. You're not wrong. Uh, we dealt with some of the problems, but it's a very large city, and this is one of the things that. I thought was always interesting, particularly about Grim Batal as a dungeon and why it was always one of my favorites. You could see off into the distance, kind of like how the original Iron Forge was uh, back in like the Vanilla WoW beta. So in the Vanilla WoW beta, um, that little middle section in Iron Forge didn't have a floor. It extended far deep into the mountain, and if you missed off the ledge, you just dropped to your death, uh, and it extended far into the sky. Uh, it was changed when, one, it really impacted performance in a major hub city, uh, but two, it was just not fun for players to just randomly die when they were uh, sitting in you know Iron Forge just trying to get to the bank or whatever the case would be. But it was this idea that it was larger than it is right and grim is much the same way we hear about these places in the books and we hear about these places uh in game and they're described as these vast complexes these vast cities these weren't just small things um and to have them be represented in game obviously you can't do that justice but grim got close because while you could only go to a small section of it you could see far off in the distance and it gave you the illusion uh, of, or, or at least the, maybe I guess the immersion of it being so much larger than we got to participate in. And the idea that there could be more scarred in there, there could be other pieces of the void there. There could be uh, aspects of the twilight cult uh, that have taken residence elsewhere. Um, we've already seen trogs were essentially, I don't want to say terraforming, but clearing rubble at one point like they were trying to dig parts of the city out um why were they doing that what were they trying to get to so there's a lot of cool little things that we could go and and get back into and maybe exploring it at some point would be on in the cards but i don't know what impetus would bring us there would it be because of the twilight uh the twilight cultists again would it be because of the old gods? Would it be because of the dwarves on, on the dwarven behalf? Would it be something Moira would want us to do where, you know, trying to reclaim pieces of the forgotten dark iron heritage uh, or wild hammer heritage or any piece of dwarf heritage that could be found there potentially? Because, again, it's an ancient city just like the other dwarven cities. So what do you think, Matt? I like Grimbitol, but I hate the dungeon a lot, and I don't want to go back there. I just what? don't like that dungeon. It's such a bad dungeon. Oh, my God. I had to tank it. I had to tank it so many times, and people were really crazy and mean and angry, and it was like, I'm tanking. Why are you yelling? Stop yelling. Stop telling me to go, go, go. I'm not going to go, go, go. I'm a tank. Tanks don't go, go, go. None of this has anything to do with what we're talking about, but it's just immediately as you start talking about Grim Batal, what's happening in my soul. Uh, anyway, I think that they're going to probably do something like to explain how come there's more Scarred in now and why they're in uh, the War Within, so they're in Khazalgar. And the, also, remember, we're not just staying in Khazalgar. We're going into the, effectively, you know, the underground places. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and... The, the, the Grimbatal, the, the under part of Grimbatal, I mean, we know it's so deep that apparently it's where when you go uh, through the portal to into the Bastion of Twilight, you're actually going into the under Grimbatal place. It's That's what that is. That whole area, um, including the part where you fight Cho'Gall and then you jump down an even deeper hole and fight... Um, I want to say Sinestra. Sinestra, right? Yeah. I can't remember Sinestra or Syntharia. Anyway, um, so you go down and fight Sinestra, and Sinestra is in that place where the uh, the Black Dragon flight eggs are. Like, well, not even the Black Dragon flight. I think they're like Twilight eggs, but she's surrounded by eggs. And that place is still further down under Grimbatal. Grimbatal goes down a long way. I think it's entirely possible that it eventually connects up with 
the both the underground that we see up in Northrend and the underground we're going to in the War Within, because there's Nerubians in both of these places. Mm-hmm. So it feels like there's a, a connection between them. And aren't there are Nerubians in Grim Batal? Like, am I crazy? I, I seem to recall them, but I don't know for sure if I'm just, no, just imagining there, them. No, there were no Nerubians in Grim Batal. Okay. See, I, I know there was some kind of weird bug thing, but I can never remember what it was. Anyway, just there's a possibility that you could do, just end up back under Grim Batal just by traveling in the Underdark. I, I I can't call it the Underdark. It's not called the Underdark. But my God, it's the Underdark. It's basically the Underdark. Yeah, I. It, it's an interesting place, and there's a lot of things that they could do to connect us back to it. And I mean, this kind of goes into the second question as well, though. Um, which I think we kind of started answering, so I want to kind of throw it up as well, uh, which is, is Grim Batal just Chernobyl of Azeroth? Um, no, because it doesn't get better. <laughs> uh, Chernobyl, at least as far as what we can see and what's being reported, at least is slowly starting to recover, right? Like, it's there's life there again. Things are starting to recede. The the radiation levels are, are dispersing, et cetera, et cetera, over the course of years. Grimbatol is just sort of like eternally cursed. That power is there. Uh, when we go there thousands of years later at this point, we are still subject to all of this old gaudy uh, curse and, and corruption and power that's going there. Not just because the Twilight cultists are there, but that's already there. There was like a Thraxi just chilling out in the throne room, right? Like it was just sitting there like, hi, I'm here. I've been here for a while. What's up? And that doesn't just happen in a, a place that's going to be okay. Yeah, and that also makes me think that the connection between the old war underground and this underground could also lead to Grim Batal. True. Because there's actually a Chithraxi literally in Old War. Uh he's um I forget his name, Vizax, yeah. Vizax is in Old War, General Vizax. And, you know, obviously there were two other Chithraxi that Loken had access to because he sent them after Tyr. Uh, so, yeah, I, and that's actually interesting to think about it because Grim Batal is on the same continent as, um, you know, the, the, the place in Lordaeron, the Tomb of Tyr, where um, one of the two Chithraxi, uh, Zakajiz, uh, ended up. My God, I hate that guy's name. Uh, <laughs> Zaka Jazz. I, it sounds like you know some kind of wacky, you know, thing. Anyway, my point is just that there's could be connections between the places. There could be all sorts of stuff. We could even end up going from place to place. There could be like a raid that takes us. Because look, look in the last we did, we went to Naltharian's weird underground place from the Dragon Isles, right? That might be connected too. That might be someplace that you can get to via the same passages. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you raise a really good point, too. And this is another thing we see, speaking of dungeons that are, like, larger than than we get to actually experience. In Northrend, when we start going through, like, the bug cities, and I'm just, I know they're not actually bugs and blah, blah, blah. We call them bug cities. We have for years. I'm just going to kind of roll with it. Um, you can see vastly out into the distance, right? Like, yeah, like there's like way off and you, you get a real sense of being in a cavern, really. You do. And one of the things that I think is interesting is if you go in there and you start looking around, you can see like tunnels like like Matt's talking about. You can see passageways into the walls that lead to who knows where. And it's interesting to think about this. There could be this giant underground network woven through the fabric of Azeroth just below the surface that we have never really explored or seen. And we're going to be, we're going to be in parts of it really. Yeah. But let me put it this way too. We know that the old gods are down there and they're physically huge. True. And we know one really big one got yanked bodily out of the world. And then we, we know there's this whole thing where the Titans working alongside, uh, but not liking a loon, essentially a loon working with Eonar used a world tree to create more holes in the crust of the world. 
That's the whole like first world tree thing. So there's been a lot of different things that are making huge passageways underground. I mean, and there's gnomes. There's weird little gnomes who pop up from time to time doing that. I don't know why, um, other than possible Dune reference. But regardless, there's lots of things traveling underground in, and or that have lived underground and created passageways underground. Um, we know that Yog saran's tendrils extend across Northrend, the whole continent. Mm-hmm. From you know his head, his, his head was essentially an old war, but he had fleshy parts of him going all the way through the continent. We know that when when uh, Yashraj was pulled out of Azeroth, he left a hole, you know, the size of the original Well of Eternity. He, the, and that thing wasn't small; it was like a giant lake. You could like look across it and distantly see, like um, I forget the two cities. One one is Zinishari. And the other one was Alundris, right? Or it was yep. Alundris and something else. Or it's Alundris and Suramar, because Alundris became Zinashari. Yes. But there's like a road that went from one to the other, and you could see them across the, the original Well of Eternity. You could look across and see the sister city. And like when you yanked him out, and he got scattered, he got torn apart, and his pieces rained down all over Azeroth. How much of him came out? Like how big, like how big of a hole did he leave? Obviously he was big enough for like the world's blood to come pouring up out of it. But like, were there a lot of tentacles that like also came out? Like I, there's a lot, a lot of things have been going around underground. The Nerubians lived down there um, for a while. The earthen there's, there's got to, there's like the, at least some earthen who have a presence down there. Um, we know that the dark trolls had like a presence down there. Trogs are and, still down there. Yeah, and we now know that there's that new kind of elfy, kind of trolly s- civilization that we're going to run into. Um, I think it's quite possible that there's a lot more going on under, you know, underneath Azeroth's skin, so to speak. Yeah, and I like the idea that the War Within is going to sort of give us at least the introduction to that, right? And I think Matt and I, and I think when Anne was still here, we all talked about this years ago particularly about the the yanking of an old god out of out of Azeroth and what was left behind and I know we you and I have talked about it recently when we did our our old god episodes um you don't know what was left behind and the one thing that I think is true in Warcraft as well as it is in real life is nature abhors a vacuum right whenever there's space something will move to occupy it and you sort of see that wherever you go and it's been almost a universal rule in Warcraft since the very beginning, right? Um, you go to Karazhan. Karazhan, essentially, when, by the time we get to go see it, is supposed to be an empty place. There's no one living there, except there is. There's uh, creatures that have grown to enormous size, whether they're due to the course of magic or the, uh, the ley lines that are pulled in or just because they've been there for so long. There's ghosts, there's undead, there's um, t- uh, essentially Titanic Watchers. Um, there's all of these aspects of life in what's supposed to be ostensibly a lifeless place. And it is a very full place despite being empty. We've gone to ruins only to find them occupied. Um, Blackwing uh, Descent, Blackwing Lair uh, are good examples of that as well. Um there's been so many of them throughout throughout our WoW career that we go into these places and there's something there. So what do you think happens when a cavern, a cavernous cavity has been, you know, essentially presented to itself? Well, if you think of it like a living organism, either, either Azeroth can heal it, which doesn't seem to be the case. Azeroth seems to have a real hard time with that, uh, possibly because we've talked about this before. It's more of a shell than it is a skin, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but what is going to are the Nerubians moving? Is that how they have such these cavernous spaces? Is this what they did in the first place? Did they just find these empty cavities and fill them? What do the earthen do with these places? What do the trogs do with these places? Trogs are good at digging. They're not that good at digging. They're not, not necessarily the brightest uh, stars in the sky. And I wouldn't exactly put them as structural engineers so I think it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what else lives in the darkness because 
that's what the war within is showing us is showing us that there's a whole there's a whole world beneath the world there's a whole layer that we get to at least start to explore and i find that uh very comforting and very very fascinating um hopefully that answers your question i'm going to move on to your third question here real quick uh just because i want to i want to make sure we get them all here do you think the events of the book would make a good caverns of time dungeon um i'm assuming that you're talking about well i guess night of the dragon because that was one of the first things you mentioned um it has a lot of creatures and characters that to serve as bosses like the altered mage hunter rask and zenderin for example I don't know. The Night of the Dragon doesn't really get mentioned a whole lot, does it, Matt? I mean, we, we there were like so there was a staff that dropped that was named after the the mage character. Zenderin never gets mentioned. Uh, like Zenderin was a character who existed to basically annoy Valyria. Um, not Valyria. Sorry. Uh, no, it is Valyria. It is Valeria. Uh, Valeria, Valeria Windrunner. I was confusing her with like the Sanguinar girl. Valeria. No, no, sorry, sorry. It's Verisa. Verisa, yes. See, so it's, it's, Valeria, it's Verisa. Verisa. Verisa Windrunner was kind of like beefing with him because he was like a cousin, and it was just like okay, whatever. I, I don't. I just felt really odd. I, I, I don't have a problem with Day of the Dragon. I, I like it quite a bit. I, I just think Night of the Dragon doesn't feel like a book that really needed to exist. Yeah, it and, was weird. It was, you know, you don't see the lore from it get mentioned a lot. I mean, it the thing is, it's really weird because that the stuff from it comes back. Like, there's that monster that drains mana, and it's like the the horrible dragon beast, which is pretty much like a prototype of the one we fight mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in the uh, Dragon Soul raid. It feels like a lot of the ideas came back again, and we're just kind of like done again. Like, and nobody was like, hey, let's tie this to the Knight of the Dragon. No, nah, let's just, you know, not. But I do know that the uh, the, the main Naru mage who's in the story, uh, or priest, I think she's a priest, um, the, her staff is somewhere in WoW. I know that much. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. It's part of the... Uh, it's not really part of. It's tied in with, like, a continuation of the Sunwell trilogy. And I think it ties in with one of the mangas, but, and this is not to say that it's bad. It's just, it Matt's right. It's one of those things that it's hard to understand why it exists and looking at the time yeah, frame, like it's, it's a, a good. Yeah. I'm just gonna say, it's not like he just said, it's not saying it's bad. It's just like, why is this here? It, like, like Darganax is in there. There's the Zeraku. Um, we don't, they, they don't, do much. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to put this. It feels like a book where it, like if you didn't know Sinestra's the book existed, in there for whatever reason. Yeah. If you didn't know the book was there, it doesn't take away anything. The book doesn't add anything that you need. Like, do you need to know that Deathwing got the eggs that he uses to create his uh, uh, Twilight Drakes from this place? Uh, do you need to know that Syntharia Sin- slash Sinestra um, is breeding Darganax here, and that's why she's so messed up. Like, not just because Deathwing messed her up, but the, he's, he's even worse because of this place. Because at one point we see her, it, you, we see her Syntharia slash Sinestra in Burning Crusade. She's actually there. She's in the Nether Drake quest line. She is, yeah. Yeah. And she when she turns into a dragon, it's a normal dragon. I mean, it's got scars, but it, it can still fly it's not a huge monstrous thing coming out of the ground you know like the way she looks in grim batal uh or bash and twilight she's in bash and twilight she's barely even recognizable as a dragon like she's like some kind of horrible something but you don't need to know this book exists to know that because you know what i mean it just nothing that happens in this book feels like it does anything and that's unfortunate because, like I said, like like you said, it's got you know it's the Scarden are in it, uh, Crassus and Calic are in it. Yeah, there's so one thing I want to talk about this as well is, and again, I know a lot of people really love this book. It's it's from 2008, right? It's from a time where 
the writers were sort of hired on and kind of given free reign in a lot of ways, you know, especially with like in this particular case, uh, it's Richard Knack, right. That wrote it. Um, in a lot of ways, it feels a lot like his D and D writing or a lot of his other writing. It feels a lot like Dragonlance. Some of those books were just written for the sake of being written, not necessarily because they served a greater purpose. And some of the bits and pieces here are just never mentioned again. Like, Verisa never talks about going to Grim Batal. There's no sign of them when we go to Grim Batal, even though theoretically we're in the areas that they were taken and held captive. Um, we don't see this massive army of Skarden that were there during this book. And as a matter of fact, they're barely mentioned. And then up until the war within, we really didn't talk about them at all outside of some vestiges of them with a couple intro quests that refer to them uh, and maybe sort of like in a roundabout way. They don't even think they call them Skarden. Um, I think they just call them corrupted dwarves. And then the Trog, the Trog's abilities that are left behind. It's one of those things where it was a interesting concept that didn't pay dividends. And it's one of the few books that really just didn't. Um, yeah, I think to a certain degree, and again, we're not trying to bag on the book as a book. Um, it's actually a, a pretty decent read, if for no other reason that you get Verisa without much of Ronan. Uh, I don't think Ronan was dead yet when this book came out. No, he was not. In the time, but he's barely in it. Um, but but Verisa's in it quite a bit, and it's fine. It's good character stuff. Um, it just doesn't. It doesn't feel like it connects up to anything. Like you don't. Like I said before, you don't need to this book to understand anything that you're doing. When you go to Grim Batal, if you read this book first, it can actually hurt your understanding of what's going on. Like, you ever hear those drinking games where if you know what's going on, you actually have to take two shots because it's that confusing? That's what this is like. It's it's like you go, wait a minute, where the heck is Darganax's chamber? Where they, they kept... They were feeding nether dragons to him. Where were they doing that? Um, was it like someplace deeper that we never go? Because we go pretty deep. Um, we, we we go down to a chamber with like a giant, you know, Chithraxi in it. Was that the chamber? Was and, and you know, it, it gets kind of hard to navigate Grim Batal if you've read the book and are trying to figure out where the places from the book are. So yeah, I I don't know. I it's a it's a strange strange book to me, and and the whole deal about like Sinestra in this, uh, she's not like I don't know. I don't like I said, she shows up in the game and suddenly she doesn't even look like herself anymore, and not entirely sure why that is. Um. Uh. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not really helping very much here. No, uh, I mean it, it's it's. And going back to like the root of the question is, do you think it would make for a good cameras of time dungeon? I don't, I don't think so. And part of that it, is for one thing, it would have to be completely redesigned because nothing in the book it. is in Grim Batal as the current Grim Batal model stands. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the biggest problem with it, right? Is that this is why we're, we're sort of prefacing that the book kind of existed in its own Island, uh, even though it's, related to the Sunwell trilogy and, and another set of the mangas, even though it's related to that, it sort of stands alone. And the problem with that is because it isn't interconnected. It makes it a really difficult sell for a caverns of time instance. Think of all the caverns of time dungeons and raids we've had up to this point. It's, you know, us fighting Archimonde, pretty huge moment tied up with everything in the game at that point. Uh, going back to the the original, uh, you know, dealing with Azara and the the invasion through the uh, through the uh, why can't I think of the name? Matt, help me out. The, the Well of Eternity. There we go. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, but the 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 Legion coming through the Well of Eternity, the demonic invasions, going back and and seeing uh, High Mountain, like all these things are candidates because they tie into sort of like the greater arcing story. Here, though, nothing that happens here really affects anything else, which is a weird statement to kind of say. Um, it's a cool story, but it's almost like that 
the uh, the what if comics. It, it, they're they're really fun to read, but they don't really matter in the long run long term run of things. So maybe maybe it going back and being rewritten or reworked in a way that fits the greater narrative could be something that we see in the future or referencing it now that we're going and dealing with scarred in. And now that we're chasing Zalatath and now that we're going underground again, maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something that we can have a discussion about it. So yeah, especially since Madon's coming back in it and everybody just stopped listening to us then. <laughs> uh, if you don't know who, if you don't know who Madan is, you just keep it go that to way. Page four hundred four of of Chronicle, because he's not found. Uh, anyway, yes. um, hopefully that answers your set of of uh, questions there, Vixie Link. Uh, we're going to move on to our next one. This one comes from Skafir. Hey all, obscure Diablo question for you. Lorath is considered an old man in Diablo Four. But how old is he relative to the world of Sanctuary? Outside of getting killed by demons, your neighbor, or the general horrors of the Diablo world, how long could a person live? The Nephilim seem to be biologically immortal, so it seems possible that Lorath has a good while before nature takes its course. Also, would being a mage affect this at all? Uh, I'm going to let Matt take a run at this, because it's Diablo. Yeah, Lorath is um, about 70 in terms of how old he is, because the Diablo four is about 50 years after the end of Diablo three Reaper of souls. And he's a, he's a young man at that time. He's like in his twenties, maybe, maybe mid twenties. But I mean, it's actually kind of funny because they got an actor who is actually in his forties, but who has a very youthful voice to do the original Lorath voice. Mm -hmm. Um, If you've watched, if you've played Spider-Man or Spider-Man two, it's the same voice actor. Uh, Yuri Lowenthal. Yuri himself, like, he's, like I said, he's in his 40s, but he sounds like a teenager. So Lorath sounded very youthful. I tend to peg him in his 20s. Uh, if they meant for him to be older than that, then he'd be older than that still. But I'm going to go with 20s, so he's in his 70s. Uh, how long do people live on Sanctuary if they're not being killed by the various things on Sanctuary that want to kill them? I mean, look at Deckard Cain. Uh, that dude was pretty freaking old. Um, he wasn't like a thousand years old, but he was he was fairly old. Um, I think that in the case of like mages, some mages seem to be able to preserve their lives for a while, but a lot of times there seems to be like you know deals have to be made. It's one of the reasons that the Mage Clan Wars happened. Because some of the mage clans were like, you know, making packs with demons. Uh, at least one mage clan made a pact with a, with an angel, and that's why we have the sightless eye. Uh, so yeah, there was various things going on, but generally speaking, most people seem to live about the same as like humans in, in Earth's history. Uh, there are people in in like our you know history who are alive in a period far less medical knowledge than we've got now that live to be very old. It was rare, but it did happen. So I believe that's the goal in terms of this. Um, I don't think Lorath will die until Lorath decides to let himself die. Yeah. Because I mean, for one thing, for one thing, Lorath made a deal that when he does die, his head's going to go have to go be on that tree, the tree of whispers. And the worst part about that's going to be is he's going to be there with his, you know, ex apprentice for eternity. I I can't think of anything worse than having the student that you taught, who then took everything you taught him and screwed up everything with it. Uh, I don't think those two guys, Elias and Lorath, are not going to have a fun time on the tree together. Uh, but in general, keep in mind the Nephilim aren't humans. They're ancestral to humans, but humans were created by the world stone, essentially stripping all the good stuff out of Nephilim when they had children, their children didn't inherit the divine power that Nephilim have within them because Nephilim have within them a recombination of the power that was split when the, the primordial Anu to- turned himself into the diamond warrior Anu and uh, Tathamet, the, the seven-headed dragon demon. 
when that happened, those two entities were divided, thus dividing the primordial Anu, who was never again, you know, one being. The only piece of him left was the world stone, which was the eye of Anu. And as a result of that, when the uh, angel and a demon working together created sanctuary, sanctuary continued to exist. It didn't go away when they stopped, when it was not being concentrated on anymore. It's also possible that's because the world stone was brought inside of sanctuary, but, but I don't want to get too tied up in this. My point is just that a Nephilim, but a Nephilim being effectively immortal. I don't know if you'd say they were biologically immortal or they just, you know, a lot of them died, but then can come back whenever they feel like it. Like, I don't I mean, that's definitely the case with Bolkathos. Bolkathos has been gone for a long time yet. Bolkathos showed up during the sin war. Um, we just lost, uh, Lenarian slash Rathma. He just died. And I am absolutely no problem believing he's going to show up again anytime. You know, it, it feels less like the Nephilim are biologically immortal or whatever that means. It feels like they are just so powerful that they can just kind of be there when they choose to be. Um, and you'll notice when we play a Nephilim in Diablo 3, you get stronger and stronger and stronger in a way that you never see, not even from the Diablo 2 heroes or um, the Diablo 4 hero. The, the, the power gets overwhelming to the point where you have to make, you make a deal with like death magic to be able to fight Maltheo on an even keel and you stomp him. And yet you're still, they, they keep saying, um, what's his name? Keep saying this. Tyrael keeps saying his heart is still mortal or her heart is still mortal. Mm -hmm. And what will they do? So I don't feel like the Nephilim, at least not the Nephilim that we meet in Diablo three was immortal in that way. Uh, I don't think that they were unkillable. I think it was much more along the lines of <laughs> they could kind of ignore it if they wanted to. Like half the time they'd be ghosts, but they could make themselves not be a ghost if it was really important. And in fact, it feels almost like Bull Kathos and uh, Fiakla Giar, a.k.a. Vasily, who is the same thing that Bull Kathos was for the barbarians, but for druids, they both seem to have just kind of gone to vacation in the lands of the dead, wherever dead people go. They seem to have yeah. gone vacationing there. And then they come back from time to time when they feel like it. So it's, it's hard to answer that part of your question, but I think average person in the Diablo world, if they say built an incredibly big castle, absolutely lined with stuff that kills demons and monsters and just, you know, had all their food tested by somebody who's willing to test their food and just, you know, stayed away from everything could live about as long as a human can live. Yeah. That, that would be my guess based on what we've seen. I was going to say, I think at one point they mentioned that like humanity on average is expected to, you know, seventies is a really good long life, but it's sanctuary. So, I mean, you step outside, heck, you don't even have to step outside. You're asleep in your bed and you might just, you know, wake up dead. It's it's something that can happen in Sanctuary. The interesting thing, though, is like humanity is varied in in Diablo quite a bit. Matt touched on some of it, but like the cultures are, are very, very diverse. And mm -hmm. each of them, because of their their culture and their powers and their rituals, may have different life expectancies. As, uh, you know, the, the life expectancy of an Ascari, uh, or, you know, as the game refers to them, Amazons from the Scovos Isles, may be different than a regular person uh, who just happens to be living in, like, Lute Galane. Um, or, you know, but the Nomad. Covered as Shen. Yeah, Covered as Shen. Covered as Shen. Well, well Covered as Shen that might be a god, yeah. <laughs> covered as Shen might be a god, but they're currently in a mortal body. Yep. And yet that body is very old. Yep. Now, is that body very old because the God in it is keeping it going? What is a God? Like there's we, with the spirit born coming into the game, we're seeing yet another approach to the idea of things that are not angels or demons in Diablo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that <sighs> there's a lot of things like the one I keep bringing up is Tragul. 
uh, who I think we've already seen in Diablo 4. Tragul, we don't know what Tragul is. Like, it, it calls itself the Dragon of the Balance. What does that mean? What are you doing? So, yeah, it, it, it's difficult. There, there's all these different things, like like Joe mentioned before. Well, like, if you go to Tianza and they've got their gods, some of which are demons, some of which seem to be other things. You go to the, you know, the Scovos Isles and you've got the Ascari, they have a completely different relationship with their, they actually straight up have an angel that they talk to or have in the past talked to. Um, you go to uh, the mountains of Novgorod and you suddenly you find all these monks and the monks seem to be able to live a really long time. Yeah. Like so, yeah, it, it is. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to say, we, we don't know how those powers and how those, those interacting essentially with the weave of, of reality. I don't know other, any other way to put it affects longevity either it could shorten it it could increase it it's it's very interesting mortality also is sort of a loose topic in diablo matt pointed this out with you know a couple of our our wonderful uh founding fathers of of humanity here uh the children of bukathos like bukathos and, and and them are they dead are they just on vacation did they just decide to like I'm going to go over to this other realm of existence for a little while because I can like, and we see others able to sort of transcend that reality. And there's also another layer to that as well. The dead don't really stay dead in sanctuary. How many ghosts have we talked with? How many, you know, ancient Kaylee Ark will not stay down, man. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We've literally talked with the spirit of ancient Nephilim. We've literally talked with uh, remnants of Pope. Zoltan Cool. We haven't even talked about Zoltan Cool, and and the fact that is he dead? Yes. Is he alive? Also, technically, yes. Like he's mortality is a weird thing in Diablo, um, as is immortality. Because even beings that are considered to be immortal still die they just get regenerated as they pass through the sieve right like we talked about angels angels can die but their energy doesn't get destroyed it just basically goes back to the arch and and poops out another angel demons don't technically die either they essentially recoalesce into their form back in the hells and then charge forth we've seen it with andara we've seen it with uh all the prime evils we've seen it with almost all of the lesser evils at this point We've seen it with rank and file demons. Um, so like mortality is a weird, weird thing uh, in, in Diablo. And one could actually make a case that nobody ever really truly dies. You just change forms. But I I don't know. Like, is there anything else to add to that, Matt? Well, I, I was thinking about it in terms of the firstborn who are the also the ancients, also, you know, blah, blah. There's various ones. Um, there's like Talek, uh, Madak, and um, Korlik. They were, you know, the ones on Ariat Summit. They were not Volkathos level, but they were, they were the ancients. Like when you hear Call of the Ancients or any of those barbarian abilities, these three guys, one of them is a woman, uh, are the ancients in question. Uh, in fact, when, when destroying his way through um, Sesheron, Baal has to kill them. But they were already dead. Except were they dead? And are they dead now? Like that's, it's one of those things. It's like the more you look at the Nephilim, the firstborn and so forth, like the one that comes to mind to me is Isu. Oh, uh, okay. The founder of the, the founder of the Zan Isu and uh, let's see. And someone was talking to Isu. Um, no, Isu was talking to the sorceress character um, from Diablo two. And she says, your soul is inundated with power. Let it overflow and your enemies will quickly learn to fear it. Um, and she's ext- basically instructing that sorceress. And how is Isu instructing a sorceress at, the you know at the time of Diablo 2 when Isu was like literally there 
like like right there, right after Lenarian was born, and right around the same time as um, Bulkathos and Fiacla Gyar. Isu was exactly as old as them. She was in that generation, and I, I don't know. It's it's very it's strange to see Isu in particular. Isu is the inventor of magic as mortals use it on Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The whole deal with elemental power, like that level of sorcery, that level of conjuring, which you'll notice her version doesn't draw on demons. Like they're just elemental magics. They don't, at no point does she, does she touch on demons? Why would she? She's half demon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her, her mother is literally Lilith and her father is literally Inarius. Um, and we don't know that, but we don't know who Bolkathos or Fiacla Giar's mother and father are. There are other demons and other angels who came to sanctuary with Lilith and Inarius, but we know that Linarian was their child, and we know that Isu was their child. And it's also notable that when uh, the World Stone was sealed away. Bulkatho said that it was sealed away to avoid people like Isu. Because Isu would have used its power to ravage sanctuary, he says. But what does that mean? What does it mean? Like what would they have actually done with it? Would they have broken it? Like like uh Tyrion did? I mean, the whole reason that they couldn't have children that would like them was the world stone. And meanwhile, too, also the Zan Isu exists to this day. The Zan Isu clan was one of the clans that survived the Mage Wars. They were directly founded by her, her students. And that's just like I I find myself wondering, like, people people don't know. In in the game, it's repeatedly said that they don't know if Isu is alive. They don't know where Isu is or if Isu is buried or what. They have no idea what happened to Isu. So, yeah, I forgot did about Isu that actually. Travel the world? Yeah, yeah. So, there's a lot to Isu that we don't really talk about very much because there's not a lot of concrete answers to it. But, yeah, Isu changed the world. Like, in a way, I think it's, again, I think it's Bulkathos who comments on she would probably have been annoyed by the fact that people don't remember her because she changed the world. Like, she brought magic, mage clans come out of her. The sorcerers and wizards of Diablo are learning her tradition. Like as opposed to necromancers or opposed to like, you know, anybody who's like demon summoning or whatever, the tradition of, of mages who don't use like death or demon power comes from Isu. Just like the necromancy comes from Rathma and, you know, Druid magic comes from Fiacla Gyar and hitting things really freaking hard with axes Apparently, Bulkathos is where you get that from. I don't know why we needed a, a like a divine figure for that, but you know, regardless, Isu is like very important, and we don't hear much about them. But did Isu seems to be if, if Isu is dead, nobody knows it, and you'd think at least Rathma might know because that's his deal, and yet you never you never hear or see anything about it. So there there's just a lot to the uh, firstborn. Yeah. And as a result, like, because there's so much of the firstborn life on sanctuary is just complicated. I mean, the legacy they left behind is complicated. The legacy that we're forging forward is complicated. Uh, I suspect that your question might actually start to get maybe some answers in the next expansion, at least a little bit dealing with it, because I think, I think well, what Laura, we're gonna, it's probably going to be in it, yeah. Yeah, but I also think that the concept of what it means to be alive or what it means to be a human is going to be explored to some extent, and I think the idea of more mortality will will be at least discussed. So you'll probably get something. But I think that's going to do it for today, friends. Uh, Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means that this podcast signing community is able to thrive and grow. 
Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefit like early access to the podcast. Better chance of having your question answered on our podcast or the queue in an ads free site experience. Again, if you have questions for this or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those in to podcast at blizzardwatch.com. You can also hit us up on Discord with the Q and Podcast Questions channel, as well as the Patron Q and Podcast Questions channel, where we tend to look for your questions and suggestions first. Uh, again, please specify the show that it is for and any special pronunciation of your name. But thank you very much for joining us today, friends. We'll see you next week. <laughs>